Oh, Father, we come and we ask that you continue to work just like you've already been working. You have proven yourself faithful and you've proven yourself good over and over and over again in our lives, in the life, life of our church, the lives of people around us. And there's no reason whatsoever to think that you won't continue to be good, that you won't continue to be faithful. Father, when I think about Danita Carson, the way you've been faithful with her this week, you are to be praised. When I think about the way that this church has stepped up and, and uh, gathered together many, many items to send to St. Vincent for relief there, Father, you are to be praised. When I think about the Romaine family who's joined us today and next week and they're on furlough here for a few months, Father, you are to be praised for the way that you're working in their lives and in the church there in Spain. Now, Father, as we turn our attention to your word, I pray that in these moments, you help us get rid of any distraction we brought into the room with us. That, Father, you will be magnified, that you will be lifted high, and that, Father, when we leave this place, we can't help but be changed because of our time here in this place. Father, we love you, but we only love you because you first loved us. And you sent Jesus to die in our place, the death that we deserve to die. Father, thank you for that. And it's in Jesus' holy and precious name I pray. Amen. Take your Bibles and turn to Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5. We are in the middle of the study of Ephesians, and um, we have a little bit more to go. It's still going to take us several weeks to get through the end of, of Ephesians. But right now, we're really talking about what it means to live practically as Christians. And I'll remind you, as I did last week, that we live in this way, not so that we can earn God's favor, but because God's favor is already given to us as Christians. I told you last week that religion says, I obey so I can be accepted. You remember that? I obey so I can be accepted. The gospel, on the other hand, says that there is not enough good that I could ever do to earn God's favor, and it's only comes, his favor only comes through the free gift of salvation that is given to me through the work of Jesus Christ. But once I'm a Christian, there's certain things that are just naturally expected of me as a Christian. My life is going to be different as a result of being a Christian. Um, my, my attitude is different. My words are different. The way I live my life is different. We're going to talk more about what that means here in just a couple of moments. Anytime you try to do good things, to, 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 to try to make God happy with you, or, or to try to avoid God's wrath, then you have forgotten the way the gospel works. God's grace and his mercy is not a reward to be worked for. It's a free gift that simply needs to be accepted. That's it. And once it's accepted, hang on. Because God has a plan for your life that will take you on the right of your life and will take you places that you never could have gone on your own. Let's read our passage for today. It's going to be Ephesians chapter 5, verses 15 through 21. And I want to invite you to stand up as we read God's word together. Ephesians chapter 5, starting in verse 21. Look therefully, look, not, not therefully, let's start that again. Look carefully then. By the way, are you all awake this morning? Thank you. I appreciate that, Jeff. Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time, because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. Now, walk in wisdom. That's what we're talking about today, walking in wisdom. You may be seated. Um, <clears throat> we are going to talk this morning about imitating God by walking in wisdom. If you look at the very first words there in chapter 5, what does it say? Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children. So the way that my kids would imitate me and do the things that I do, I am supposed to imitate God and do the things that he does, okay? He is characterized. One of his character qualities is the wisdom with which he, he, he functions. 
And so we are in turn to walk in wisdom. That's what Paul's trying to communicate to us here. Now, there's certain things that are spelled out in Scripture that as Christians we are to do, certain commandments that they're given, and so we obey those things. But I want you to catch this. It'll be on the screen for you. For the Christian, wisdom means learning to think clearly about those things not clearly spelled out in Scripture. Wisdom means learning to think clearly about those things not clearly spelled out in Scripture. Now, there's a lot of really big decisions that you are going to make in life that are not outlined in Scripture. Here's an example. The Bible doesn't tell you outright what to watch on TV and what not to watch on TV. Okay, does it? I, don't, I can't find that anywhere. Here's another example. Um, it doesn't outline what job you are, should, you are to take. So you have two options. you got this job, job A, job B. Uh, look at the Bible. Does it say take job A or job B? It doesn't really, it doesn't communicate that, does it? Or it doesn't tell you how to spend your money per se or who to hang out with, hang out with John but, but not with Susie. It doesn't say that. The Bible isn't clear on some of those things. And that's where wisdom for the Christian comes into the picture. Verse 15, look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise but as wise, making the best use of the time because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Now listen, God is at work all around us. He's always working. There's always things that God is doing. He's doing things to advance his kingdom, and he wants to use us in that. Even right now, there's a battle for souls that's taking place. It's a battle between, spiritual battle between God and, and Satan. This is serious, serious stuff. A little bit later on in Ephesians, we're going to read these words. In chapter 6, verse 12, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Y'all, this is a serious fight that we as Christians are in. It's a serious life that we are living now, if you're a Christian, you are sealed into the body of Christ. That means you are a child of God. You're in the family of God, and you're on God's side fighting against Satan. And God's will is that we join him where he is working. But listen, we can't be a part of that will if we are foolish with our lives. We have to walk in wisdom if we're going to be able to keep in step with what God's doing around us. Anytime we're foolish with our lives, God and foolishness don't mix. So we walk in wisdom. That's why this is so important for the Christian to understand. When we walk in wisdom, we are following God. We are at work with God. We are doing his will in the world around us. But as soon as we move over to the foolishness sign, that's where it just doesn't work, doesn't jive. Look at verse 16. And I really believe that this verse is the key to understanding this whole idea of, of being wise. Here's what it says. Making the best use of the time because the days are evil. If you read that in the New King James Version, here's what you read. Redeeming the time because the days are evil. And that word of, and the idea of redeeming there is, is really important for us to understand. The culture that we live in is, is evil. Which means if we want to grow closer in our relationship with God, then we got to be intentional about it. You cannot coast into closeness with God. The days are evil. To grow with God takes intentionality. Paul says that there's a lot of things that are lawful for a Christian to do. In other words, you're not breaking the law if you do those things. They're allowed for you as a Christian, but they're just not helpful. All things are lawful, but not the, all things are helpful. They don't advance God's purposes in, in my life. All right, so let me ask you, what is it that you do with your time? What do you do with your time? Now, watching TV all the time may not be morally wrong, but it's not helpful for growing spiritually, and it really, it might not be helping you grow at all. Or we can talk about relationships. Maybe you have relationships that are not wrong, but that you're, they're just not helping you grow spiritually. Or here's another way to put it. In light of what we know about the world, how should we be spending our time? If we're walking in wisdom, how should we be spending our time? And this is where this idea of redeeming the time comes in. Church, we are on a rescue mission. 
There are certain things that may not be morally wrong, but they are not wise in what we know about the world. This is one of the reasons I went into ministry. There's a lot of career paths that I could choose, but in light of what I knew about eternity, what was the best use of my time? If you know people are dying around you without Christ, what should you be doing with your time? Is it right to play while people perish? For me personally, God had given me a gift to to teach and to preach and to lead So I decided to pursue that as a way of redeeming the time. And I'm not telling you you that you should leave your career. That's not what I'm saying at all. But are you leveraging your career in ways that would be considered wise in light of the gospel? Are you using your career or your your job, whatever it is that you do, are you using it to spread the gospel? Here's another way to think about this. Are you going on any kind of mission trip? instead of only going on vacation. If you know the ship that you are on is going down, what should your attitude be? Is it not to make sure that people know about the rescue boats? Wisdom has a great overarching question that can be asked really in a variety of circumstances. And here it is. A thousand years from now, will I be glad I lived my life this way? A thousand years from right now, am I going to be glad that I lived my life in this way? Am I going to be glad I made the decisions I made? Or am I going to regret not redeeming the time for the sake of gospel expansion in my world around me? What's it going to be? A thousand years from now, will I be glad I lived my life in this way? Sometimes we have to ask that question and we have to adjust our lives. We have to adjust our lives with the all right, now I need to, I need to, need to move a little bit, s- recenter my life. Now here's the reality. You cannot walk in wisdom. You cannot live the Christian life with any kind of victory unless there is a force of power beyond yourself that's helping you. You can try all day long, but you're going to reach a point where you just can't do any more. You can't go any further. Something has got to help you. In fact, the only way to be successful is with help. And honestly, there's a, there's a lot of ways that we could turn to for help. Some of them are wrong. Some of them are, are right. And as we continue reading here, Paul gives us an idea of what this help is not and what this help is right here in our passage. So look at verse 18. He says, And do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. Now, there's a whole lot of people in our our culture, in the world around us, who turn to alcohol to give them the help that they need to function in life. Paul, in in, in this passage, he talks about taking alcohol usage to excess, to drunkenness. A drunkard uses the alcohol to numb themselves so they can function in life. Now, Paul mentions alcohol here. Drunkenness from alcohol specifically, but the reality is he's referring to anything that controls us that is not ordained by God. As Christians, we are to be controlled by or filled with, is the word that's used there, filled with the Holy Spirit. The problem is that Christians are notorious for being controlled by other things besides the Holy Spirit. There's, there is alcohol, that's one of them, but we're also controlled by greed. We're controlled by power, by food, by relationships. There's any number of things. Paul talks about drunkenness here, but he's also talking about all of those things as well. And here's how we know that. Look at the middle of verse 18. He talks about drunkenness, and then he says, for that is debauchery. You know what debauchery is? It's kind of one of those big words that you hear every now and then. You're like, I'm not really sure what that means, right? Here's what it means. It is excessive indulgence in sensual pleasures. Excessive indulgence in sensual pleasures. God created pleasure. Do you hear that? God created pleasure. But when we go to the excess with it to where that controls us instead of the Holy Spirit controlling us, that is when we are foolish, is what Paul's saying here. Debauchery is whatever feels good, whatever pleasures us, whatever gives us a high besides the joy that the Holy Spirit provides us. And what Paul is saying is that there is something that is better than being controlled by alcohol that God has for his children. The presence of God through the Holy Spirit trumps the pleasures of this life any day. 
alcohol and status in this world and food or whatever it is are going to give you a high for a time, but you are going to go back to it because it will only numb your senses for a little while. Here's one of the ways I choose to think about this. Those things that we often turn to here in this life, whether it's, it is alcohol or food or whatever it is, those things numb. Those things numb, but the Holy Spirit awakens. See the difference? Those things take away the feeling for a little bit to help us function in life. Oh, but the Holy Spirit, when you are filled with the Holy Spirit, he awakens you to see things, to do things, to be a part of things that never would have been a part of your life otherwise. When something tough happens in your life, you've got a decision to make. You're going to turn to a substance that numbs or the Holy Spirit that awakens. The numbing substance distorts reality. The Holy Spirit clarifies reality. And when you are filled with the Holy Spirit, the goodness and the grace of God is going to be your guiding force. Here is where I go. I walk in wisdom when when I am filled with the Holy Spirit. If you want true life that is fulfilling, wisdom says, don't turn to the things of this world to give you joy. If you want true joy, be filled with the Holy Spirit. That's what wisdom says. How does that happen? How, how How do I get filled with the Holy Spirit? Paul continues here by saying this. At the end of verse 18, he says, but be filled with the Spirit. And then I inserted the word by there, okay? You won't find that in your Bible, but Paul is connecting these two thoughts. But be filled with the Spirit by addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. Now, everywhere you go, um, you see people listening to music. In fact, pretty much everywhere you go, whether you realize it or not, you're listening to music. Whether it's in the, in the car with the radio, maybe you're listening to a talk radio, which you can have that. Um, I'll take music any day. But maybe it's listening, in, maybe you're shopping for groceries. What's playing as you're shopping for groceries? Music, right? You see people walking down the street and they got their AirPods in and they are probably listening to music unless they're listening to a podcast or that dreaded talk radio again. But anyway, everywhere you go, um, people are listening to music. Music is emotionally stimulating. uh, Music takes what's on your mind and what's on your heart, and it brings it out to some kind of responsive action. You're driven to action because of music. If you see me get excited down here sometimes, it's because what's in my mind and on my heart is coming out through my music, right? Anybody else get there sometimes? You want to joyfully it it just explode music is a gift from god it's a part of his creation and we read there to address one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs so what does that mean do we come up to each other and just just kind of sing hello how are you today (laughs) please don't do that (laughs) you know how awkward that would be don't do that But here's here's how you can think about this. Here's how you can think about this. When I'm working on something that I really need to focus on, I turn on soundtracks for movies, for background music. For example, the Lord of the Rings soundtrack is a great one for me to listen to in the background as I'm trying to maybe study or, or, or do something else. The soundtrack is the background music to the movie. The soundtrack is the background music to the movie. Now, most of the time, if we're watching a movie, we don't notice the background music, but the soundtrack sets the tone for what you perceive about the movie. So when the the music rises, you know something big is happening. When it quiets down, it's a chance for you to kind of breathe a little bit. Got to catch my breath after that, whatever it is. We all have a soundtrack of sorts that plays in the background of our lives. The soundtrack that's playing in your life is directly affecting the filling of the Holy Spirit in your life. When that soundtrack is filled with Scripture, and when Scripture is spoken out loud or sung out loud, you cannot help but be filled with the Spirit. Scripture should be fresh on our mind. It should be dancing around in our hearts. And we should be helping each other as Christians with that. 
And for example, here's how this plays out. When a fellow Christian has tragedy that strikes in their life, we are reminding them of the hope that's found in Jesus' redeeming love. When a fellow Christian is filled with fear, we counter that fear with the tune of Jesus' words of, peace, be still. When another Christian sings the song of, I can't, we sing the song of, you're right, you can't, but we can do all things through Christ who gives us strength. When we sing the song of, I'm all alone, I have nowhere to turn, I have no one to walk through life with me, another Christian can counter with Jesus' words of, I will never leave you or forsake you. We will be continually filled with the Spirit when we sing the soundtrack of the Word of God to ourselves and to other Christians around us. Listen, that is why it's so important for us to come into a setting just like this. Now, can you be on your own as a Christian and not gather with other Christians? And feel like you're surviving? Yes, it's absolutely possible, but over time, the inevitable result is that the soundtrack of your life will not be centered on the Word of God because you're not hearing this sung back and forth to you by other Christians. And you're not immersing yourself in the preaching of God's Word. May the soundtrack of our lives be the Word of God. That means that we read it, we memorize it, we listen to it, we sing it to other people. Why would we expect to be Christians who walk in wisdom, who are filled with the Spirit, who address one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs if we're not immersing ourselves in God's Word? Folks, immerse yourself in God's Word because that is the key to wisdom. Now, while we're on this topic, I want to to mention this. Songs are sermons that you actually remember. Songs are sermons that you actually remember. How many of you remember what I preached last week? Uh, Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't see any hands coming up. I don't see any hands at all coming up. (laughs) We got got one over here. And that's the thing. Oftentimes we come into here, we sit under the preaching, and, 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 and we just don't remember. But let me ask you this. We sang a song last week, In Christ Alone. In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength. My song, this cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are stilled, when striving cease. My comforter, my all in all, Here in the love of Christ, I stand. So you can remember that song, but you can't remember my sermon. You didn't have the words for you on the screen right there, did you? No. Songs are sermons that we remember. Songs that we sing here that are are glorifying to God, that are based on Scripture, speak to our soul when we sing them. They carry us through life. When we're low, they lift us up. When we're high, they give us, help us give glory to God. Songs are sermons that we remember, so what are you preaching to yourself? What are you preaching to yourself? And the music that you listen to now, honestly, um, let me say this. That's not an excuse whatsoever, you know, you not remembering the sermon. That's not an excuse for you to not be here for the sermon. Um, instead, you, you say, well, I'll just show up for the singing and just miss the sermon altogether. No, expository preaching of God's word is vitally important for our growth as Christians. But y'all, the songs we sing help fill us with the spirit, which helps walk us walk in wisdom. I'm going to give you three points of application real quick, and I'll do this in about two minutes. You want to write these things down or maybe take a picture of the screen after all three of them come up. But here's the first one. The gospel calls us to walk in wisdom. The gospel calls us to walk in wisdom. The very nature of the gospel calls us to live our lives with wisdom. Jesus gave everything to give us life. Our response should be that we use wisdom in how we walk, redeeming the time that God has given us here on this earth. 
Number two, what you fill yourself with will affect your life. What you fill yourself with will affect your life. So are you being numbed by the temporary things or are you being stimulated by the Holy Spirit? The wise Christian is the one who is not controlled by anything except the Spirit of God. The wise Christian is going to understand that what we fill ourselves with will affect every area of our lives. And then number three, the soundtrack of your life always alters your perspective. What's the quality of the soundtrack in your life? Are you filled with songs and voices that tear you down or that build you up? Is your soundtrack one that is focused on this life only and on, only on temporary things? Or are you gathering with other Christians and building a soundtrack that gives you an eternal perspective? There's a lot for you to think about from this passage, and we didn't mine out all that there is here, but this is a starting point for you. So I want to ask that you take this passage, Ephesians chapter 5, verses 15 through 21, you take it home with you, you study it for yourself this week, and ask God to show you things that you haven't been shown already. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for this passage that outlines what it means for us in, in, a, in a simple way to walk in wisdom. We want to do what's right as Christians. Father, we want to walk with you. We want to be a part of what you are doing. Father, help us to walk in wisdom, to keep in step with what you are doing. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the opportunity to worship today, to hear preaching, to study your word together. Lord, may you honor our time together. In Jesus' name, amen.